is sufficient for the payment for our sins. Let's stand and sing together. My goodness, that goes so quick. You stand up and then it's over. And you got to sit back down again. Well, we're glad you're here today. Kind of what I really like is that when uh, you get here at different times, then you have to sit in different places because your seat gets taken. So I see people that are normally over here or over there, and people that are normally over here or over there. And so you've really messed me up, just to let me know that. I'll close my eyes and get back to your regular seats. <laughs> that way I know if you're here or if you're not. But we're so glad that you're here today and uh, glad that you um, came here on purpose. You don't come to church on accident. You come here on purpose and we're glad that you're here. Let's open up with a word of prayer. Father, thank you now. Settle our hearts. We're here now. We've committed to the hour. And uh, we need to hear from you, not from us or me in the sense of what I think. But we want to look at the scriptures of what they say. So thank you that we can. Thank you for the word of God. Thank you for those 66 love letters that challenge us sometimes uncomfortably. And thank you for the encouragement of the scriptures. What would we do without them? If we had to navigate this life on our own, we would just have to think and form our own God and form our own way and form our own eternity. But you are the creator. You are the designer. You are God, and you do love us, and you did prove that, and you did show that by sending your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to be that propitiation, to be the appeasement of your wrath, but also to show your love, that our sins can be forgiven, and that we can have a home in eternity, and we're thankful for that. Now, Father, help us. This is a big day for the church, that we can come together and worship together in spirit and in truth. Father, meet with us. Uh, change us. I don't know the needs of each person here, but I know there's needs. We do pray that you will do what we can't do. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Well, I just want to make um, uh, just a couple announcements here. One is that uh, right after the service today is going to be a little meeting for mops. You say, well, what's mops? I mean, does that mean I'm going to be cleaning? I'm going to be mopping the floor? No, it has nothing to do with that. It's actually moms of preschoolers. And we want to reach out into our neighborhood and invite moms out that uh, need to get away and talk to people their age. That makes sense. Do you remember that? You just talk to the kids all day, all day, all day, and then finally you don't even know how to talk to adults anymore. And so this program, this outreach, is, um, is to bring moms in, give them a place where they can come and be encouraged and helped in the area of parenting. Parenting's hard, isn't it? It would be nice if it was just easy. But um, so if you have an interest in that, uh, you say, well, I don't have any preschoolers. Great. We need you to because you can come alongside and help um, uh, help the younger moms and help uh, navigate this. So they have a safe place to come and a place that works. And so Harmony will be leading that meeting and with her two cohorts that are doing a great job, Jessica and also um, Robin. And so they're going to meet in the back. And it, if you just want to kick the tires and see what's going on, please go back and meet with them. And I just want to mention something else. Is uh, David um, Ichino, where is he at? Where's David? There's David. And uh, we're so thrilled. He uh, been working on passing a test that's very important for his livelihood, and that is a life producer's license, and he passed it. And so, uh, congratulations, and uh, that is underneath the tutelage of Paul and Julie Thorpe that have been training him and bringing him along. So we're so thrilled for that. And then also, I'd like to mention this, uh, he probably doesn't want me to mention it, but so uh, I'm excited for Danny and Jessica. Jessica's probably saying, what are you about to say? Uh, is that uh, uh, nobody goes to school alone, especially when you get a little bit older. It's hard to go back to school. But Danny's been working on his master's in the area of biblical counseling. And his last grades just came in. I just want to mention of the three classes he had, which are very 
in-depth classes, he was able to ace all three of them. So we're thrilled for that. But really, what really excites me is how God's going to use him to help others, to be able to show them the sufficiency of Christ no matter what they're facing. And so we're very thrilled that God brought him our way. And then last and not least, probably the top one here, is I just can't get the number 27 off my mind. Does anybody else have that today? You just can't. You, That's great. Well, the reason we have 27 on our mind is today or tomorrow, Pastor Tim is 27 years old. So make sure... Uh, you wish him a happy birthday, and um, all gifts come through me, and then I'll give him partial <laughs> of them. All right, well, let's go over our verses. We're going to get Danny back there, and uh, these are new ones because we're in the month of March now. It's already the 3rd of March. Can you believe it? I can't believe how fast uh, time is turning. So are you ready? We'll do Proverbs 4, 7, and then Proverbs 9, 10. Here we go. Proverbs Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom, and with all thy getting, get understanding. Proverbs 4, 7. Proverbs 9, 10. The fear of the Lord is beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. Proverbs 9, 10. Well, the song that we're going to sing this morning is Nothing But the Blood. Blood? Really? We're going to sing about blood? Um, Christianity, to some, is considered a bloody religion, and, and certainly Judaism was a similar comparison. But um, the reason for that is because the blood of Christ has the power to save from sin. What Christ has done for us on the cross has uh, eternal meaning, and it means that we can spend eternity with Christ. Let's stand this morning. We're going to sing 337, Nothing But the Blood. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my part in this I see. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my cleansing this I flee. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that blood of Jesus on the last. This is all my hope and peace, nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my righteousness, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the Great singing, great singing.
Praise the Lord for the blood of Christ, what he's done for us on the cross. I just have a few quick announcements I'm going to make here this morning. Um, I wanted to mention that this Saturday we're kicking off our spring outreach. And so on Saturdays, we're going to be knocking doors in the community and inviting them to come to Faith Way Baptist Church. And uh, that's going to be every Saturday. Um, however, um, one of the big emphasis that we see coming going forward is Resurrection Sunday. And that is March 31st, and that is coming up in just a few weeks. And that is a, a big outreach day. A lot of people will come to church on that day. And so we want to be inviting as many people as we can, whether that be neighbors or friends or coworkers, be thinking about someone that you can invite. You see, um, um, evangelism, and this is our missions month, um, um, we, are, we are considering uh, the missionaries that have gone around the world to share the gospel and to tell other people about Christ. And um, we can do that too. We are missionaries to, to Hampshire. And so um, uh, we have our weekend outreach that we're knocking on doors, but we also, every one of us has the opportunity to share our faith with those that are our family and friends and neighbors. And so take advantage of that if you can. Try to invite someone and have a visitor here on Resurrection Sunday. Um, I did also want to mention um, that tonight is a parent seminar. So if you have kids that you'd like to come, there is child care for um, sixth grade and under. And whether that be in the nursery or in the kids with the back, um, that is going to be Pastor Kuntz will be preaching and giving some practical and helpful, engaging parenting uh, 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 wisdom, and uh, certainly I'm very grateful for our pastor because when we've had these Sunday night seminars, they've always been so helpful. If you ever come, you know that's true, and so if you can, be there tonight at 6.30. Um, I also want to mention that we have an international fellowship coming up, and so uh, maybe you'd like to bring a dish from your nationality or a foreign dish that, that you'd like to make for that fellowship, but if you can, Please sign up in the back for that fellowship. That will, that will really help us out. Um, and then I also wanted to mention one last thing is that um, we have a lady, not we, Camp Joy has a ladies retreat uh, March 15th to 16th. That's a Friday to Saturday. And ladies, if you would like to come, you are invited. It is um, going to be a wonderful time. Um, the speaker is a phenomenal speaker for Maranatha. And um, it is a, a great weekend retreat to, to enjoy some fellowship with the other ladies. It's not just Faithway. There's going to be several other churches that are going to be there. It's going to be a big conference. And... Um, and if you would like to come, you would need to register soon, especially if you're staying overnight. If you're, if you're going to stay from Friday to Saturday, um, you can register on their website. Or if you need help, reach out to one of us. We'd be happy to, to help you, or you could call them. But uh, if you can register as soon as possible, spaces are filling up, and they're almost full. So if you are planning to be there or you haven't signed up yet, um, uh, make that decision. And I think it'll be, I, it'll be, you'll be glad you did. Um, and if you would like to come on Saturday, that's an option as well. You could drive up Saturday and attend the Saturday portion of the conference. So I just wanted to mention those announcements. And let us know if you have any questions about those, because we'd be happy to answer any of those. You can just have a seat there because it's going to be a minute. Sorry, Pete. We kind of messed Pete up there. Um, he'll be reading the scriptures in a moment. But we want to take a time since it's Mission Month. And you can see here we have our flags. And our flags represent the different countries, the different places where we are supporting missionaries. And so we want you to get acquainted with our missionaries. And one of them I'm going to speak about today is the ministry of Neighborhood Bible Time. I'm so thankful that for the last 52 years... Uh, Bible Time has been gathering young men together that are college age, right in that age there, training them and sending them out in groups of two to the most responsive mission field, and that is children and teenagers. And certainly, if you've been around Faithway very long, you've had a chance to see all the men at one time, but also as we reach out in the summer, we have two young men that come here and preach the gospel. It's very enthusiastic, but it's fun with a purpose. The real heartbeat of Neighborhood Bible Time is to train young men for future ministry. And we'll be doing that again this year, bringing in around 25 to 29 young men and um, working with them and helping them to understand ministry. And then one day, they're going to replace us. They're the ones that are going to come and serve uh, the body of Christ. I would like to just say, as I bring that to an end, as you, as you pray, pray that the young men will have a good summer. 
Uh, pray that they'll find favor wherever they go. And then pray as the children and teenagers come, they, their hearts will be softened to the gospel and that they'll come to know Christ as their Savior. And lastly, if you look at the last 72 years, it's a lot, that's a lot of years, last 72 years, there has been over 2 million boys, girls, and teenagers who have attended a neighborhood Bible time youth crusade. Hundreds of thousands have been swept into the kingdom. And there are men serving all over the United States and around the world as lay people, engineers, business people, missionaries, pastors. In fact, we have three ex-MBT evangelists in here. So would you guys stand? That would be Tim traveled, and then John traveled, and of course, Danny, which is here helping us today. And um, Danny and his friend David, who are here today, they have a real heart for missions. And I believe that's where they'll end up as well. Okay, so thank you. Okay. Before I get into reading the scriptures, I just want to say thank you so much for all of you who have been uh, contributing to the packages that are heading overseas. Uh, we have at this point, I believe, sent 10 packages totaling almost 200 pounds of material. And um, certainly that's more than our son can, can deal with on his own. So he's spreading the wealth around. And, you know, that was exactly what we were hoping was going to happen. And uh, not only is, is Aaron very grateful, but he, he's telling us how grateful all the other uh, people who are there are. Just, and it's not just, you know, the, the material that's coming, the things that they need. It's the messages, and it's just the fact that they realize there are people here who are thinking of them. And, you know, that's that connection to home that is so important when they're so far away doing things that are, uh, at the very least, uncomfortable, but also very dangerous all the time. So thank you, thank you very much. And, and we still have more at our house to, sh to ship off, so, the, you know, it, we have almost an embarrassment of riches. So thank you so much. Amen. <clears throat> so our, our reading today starts in Revelation 19.10. I hear all these people are opening their Bibles, so they're going to find out every time I make a mistake, aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's what you, I know that's really what you're doing. So. <clears throat> and I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, See thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren that, that have the testimony of Jesus, worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse... And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God, that ye may eat the flesh of kings, and the flesh of captains, and the flesh of mighty men, and the flesh of horses, and of them that sit on them, and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. And I saw the beast, and the kings of the earth, and their armies, gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse, and against his army. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire, burning with brimstone, and the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh." Let's stand together one more time, and we're going to sing song 347, And Can It Be? And what we realize about this song is that what Christ did for us on the cross 
was not owed to us. We do not deserve the Savior and all that he did for us on the cross. We are amazed and overwhelmed by the amazing love of Christ for us. Let's stand and sing 347, And Can It Be? I'm sorry. Um, we're going to continue. We got one more song. Um, we're going to sing for the sake of his name. This is our hymn of the month for March, that, since it is our missions emphasis month. And uh, this is all about the gospel. It's about, all about sharing the love of Christ, sharing the gospel with others who have not heard. So let's sing it out. Um, verses one and two, and then the chorus, and then the rest. Let's sing. to the world for the sake of his name to every nation his glory proclaim pray that the spirit wise will open darkened eyes granting new life to display Jesus' name love the unloved did not condemn, but was condemned for them. Just gospel power, for we once were the same. In Jesus' power, preach Christ to the lost. For Jesus' glory, count all else 
Alrighty, well take your Bibles if you would and turn to actually Psalm 95 and we're so thrilled to have uh, Dan, Danny here and his friend uh, David. Uh, James is not here today because he got pink eye. He called me yesterday and he said I don't know where I got it from but I got it from somewhere and I can't open my eye and, uh, and so he went to the doctor or went and was able to get uh, whatever that is that you need to get, anti-pink eye. And uh, got that medicine and is working on it now. And so the children may go ahead and make their way uh, back with Danny and David. And I believe uh, Joseph is going to be back there with them today as well. Oh, and he's got airplanes. Now, adults, settle down. If you really want an airplane, he'll give you one. I can tell when Joseph gives those out because after church you have to duck because they're flying all over the place. We need an air traffic controller in the auditorium uh, for sure. We're thankful for our guest. Thank you for coming today. We're happy to have you uh, here with us. Now the reason we're turning to Psalm 95 because really we're going through the book of Hebrews and we're in chapter number 3. But uh, chapter uh, Psalm 95 gives us... Um, Almost the same exact thing that we read in Hebrews chapter 3, which we will see and will be there um, shortly. And so if you would, turn there to Psalm 95. And what our writer is doing in the book of Hebrews is, is that he is giving us another warning. He's giving us another, all right, let's stop, let's regroup. Let's see where we're at, and let me give you this warning because I love you so much that you need this. Sometimes when we think of warnings or something like that, we think of maybe punitive. But think about it when we're driving and maybe a sign on the road says, warning, construction ahead, or warning, bridge is out. Those are things that we're so happy that they give those to us. And so this warning that we read today, let's not miss what it is. It, it's not punitive. It is, it is the Lord our God who loves us so much reminding of us of something that's very important that we need to take note to and not just so simply um, blow by uh, what he's trying to correct us on or warn us once again on. And so what our author does in the writer of Hebrews here and our author does is that he gives us history to show the presence so he's going to talk about something that happened in Israel's past that where that warning is going to come out from. And we see it in Psalm 95, starting at verse, um, let's start in verse number uh, 6. Well, it's only um, 11 verses. We'll read the whole psalm. Psalm 95. O come, let us sing unto the Lord. You did that today. It was beautiful. 
Your worship is intoxicating. It really is. Let us make a joyful noise, and some of you just did that, to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and making a joyful noise unto him with psalms. For the Lord is, is a great God and a great king above all gods. In his hands are the deep places of the earth. The strength of the hills is his also. The sea is his, and he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation, as in the day of the temptation in the wilderness, that 40 years that took place when they left out of Egypt and they refused because of unbelief to go into the promised land. Those that were 20 years and older died in the wilderness except for Caleb and Joshua, who believed God, could deliver them. So he says, don't be like that. Don't harden your heart. Uh, in the day of the provocation, the temptation, as in the day of temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my work, 40 years long was I grieved with this generation, and said, it is a people that do err in their hearts, and they have not known my ways, unto whom I swear in my wrath that they should not enter into my rest. Well, what are we talking about here? Well, we need to find that out because that's where our warning is in Hebrews 3. We'll see these same words mentioned there as well. Uh, you can turn over to uh, Hebrews 3 and we can be ready uh, for today's message. So Hebrews 3 will pray and you will find your spot. And you'll notice in Hebrews 3, you will find those same warnings or those same words. Father, thank you now. We settle down. Uh, the fellowship was sweet. Catching up with people that maybe we don't see during the week or haven't seen for a little bit. We're thankful that we can join together uh, uh, to catch up with one another, encourage one another. In the circumstances of life are difficult. All of us here could probably stand up right now and, and probably say, listen, I need prayer in this area or this is what I need or you know, pray for us or pray for my family or pray for what we're going through now. Father, we know that. And so we're glad for the encouragement of the local church. But Father, right now we turn our eyes to the text. We turn our eyes to what you have for us. Help us to learn it. Help us to apply it. Help us to understand it as it is delivered from you. Now, bless and encourage us. And Father, if somebody be here today that does not know you, they, they've slipped into the service, they've come to the service, but they're not sure when they die where they would spend eternity. They just don't know. May, though the message is not geared just exactly towards a salvation message, may they catch the gospel, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Thank you, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. So chapter 3 in Hebrews is a very intense section of Scripture. And it needs to be intense because of the subject matter. Some things are more intense than others. It brings a concern that the writer of the book of Hebrews has for the believers at that time. It is written, at the time it was written, but it's also very relevant to us today. Aren't you glad the scriptures are relevant? Otherwise, why would we even spend any time in the Old Testament or even in that fact, even the New Testament? The book of Hebrews contains several warning passages. Some are clear warnings about the danger of false doctrine and false teachers. Certainly we have seen that that has crept already into the church. Yet there are several passages that warn Christians or uh, warn Christians about their own behavior. And some seem to imply a loss of salvation for the disobedient. Well, that raises a lot of red flags because we know that once saved, always saved. We know we are sealed with the Holy Spirit unto the day of redemption. We know that God's blood is sufficient to rescue us from, 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 um, from death and hell through the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. So we do not um, fret over losing our salvation. We don't wake up in the morning and say, boy, I hope I'm saved. We are because we have the Holy Spirit. We have that 
confidence, that hope that, that we know that we are saved. And so when we see a passage that seems to imply a loss of salvation for any reason, we know that that is not true. Consider the doctrine of eternal security and how these warning passages are to be understood. And we'll look at that today as well. But today in our study, the warning passages are aimed at those who are part of the visible local church, but who do not truly know Christ. So the warning is, is that among the wheat is a lot of tares. It means among the church, the visible local church that meets and gathers all the time together, there are some who might look like they're saved, but yet they have never come to faith, and that is who the writer is talking about. The author of Hebrews directs some of his statements to mere pro pro uh, professing faith in Christ who are not actually possessing Christ. In other words, they may have a form of godliness. They might say, I'm all about God, but their heart is far from him. They've never been born again, but yet the Bible tells us they are amidst, amid us, um, uh, around us even today. So the target audience of these passages is unbelievers who are associated with the church and have been exposed to God's redemptive truth. Perhaps they've even made a profession of faith, but they have not exercised genuine saving faith. If they continue to reject Christ, they will be lost forever. They will not enter into his rest. So our principle is this, and our thought is this. Examine yourself. Listen. Flesh is flesh. Safe flesh looks the same as unsafe flesh. I cannot walk around this room and say, you're saved, you're saved, you're not saved. For only two people know that, and that is God knows if you're saved, of course, and also you know. And so through the preaching of the word, we're to examine ourselves to make sure that we're in the household of faith because there are many throughout the scriptures that... Um, that, that, that um, have made a profession of faith, but they're never possessed the Lord Jesus Christ. So it's a warning. It's a warning today to examine yourself. And that word examine means to test, to uh, scrutinize. Do I know Christ? Are my sins forgiven? So this is not a passage that I'm very concerned about and struggling with, not in the sense of this, is I don't want to, to, to cause someone to doubt their salvation, I just want you to do what the scriptures say and you'll be okay. And that is examine yourself. That's what the scripture says in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5. Examine yourself, whether you be in the faith, prove your, uh, prove your own self, knowing ye not your own self, that Jesus Christ is in you. So the text sometimes is an uncomfortable text. I kind of like to just skip over it. But that's not what we do. We have to, all the word of God is important. It is supposed to, uh, it's supposed because eternity is in the balance. That's why it's uncomfortable because Christ loves us so much and that's the price of love that he gives this warning so that we don't slip off into eternity unsaved. God loves us and he demonstrated that love by sending his son that we would see our need and put our faith in Christ alone. You and I are not able to know who's saved and who's not saved. Our text before us today is not a way that we can determine who's saved and who's unsaved. It is a loving warning to examine yourself according to the scriptures to make sure you're in the household of faith. Now let me give you an example. There's two people in the Bible, and if we did not know what God said about their eternal destination, we would probably flip-flop where they are. Give me an example. If we did not know much about Lot except what we learned about him in the book of Genesis and uh, Sodom and Gomorrah and all that took place and we did not know, we would say that man clearly is not saved. But we know in Peter, Peter confirms through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that Lot was saved, he just vexed his righteous soul. In other words, he got off. Something pulled him away from living what he knew was right. Lot believed that God would send a Savior, and his, 
his faith was believing that the promised seed would come. And so Lot's in heaven today, though his testimony would say, that guy's not saved. Hey, sometimes I get off the phone with telemarketers, and if you heard sometimes how short I am with them, you would say, he ain't saved either, and he's <laughs> preaching to us. So I'm not here to do behavioral checks here. Though the passage does talk about behavior, we're not trying to separate you based on everything you do in your life because we are growing in our progressive sanctification. We haven't all arrived. Do you ever get angry at anybody? You don't have to raise your hand. But, but just say, uh, uh -huh. are there some things you wish you wouldn't have done? Uh -huh. There's probably some things tomorrow you're going to wish you didn't do tomorrow. So it's not a behavioral thing. What it is here is understanding that the scriptures say that our faith is squarely on the object of our faith is Christ and Christ alone. Then we're born again and then God is changing us. Now, Lot's the first example. The second example is this, is Judas. Now certainly we know Judas was a traitor and because the Bible tells us that he hung himself and it also tells us that he was not saved. But if we didn't know any of that, let's say it never told us who touched the sop. You know, when they're in the upper room and he says, he that touches the sop will betray me. And he says, go out and do it. And nobody knew why Judas left. If we would not know any of that, we say, man, of course Judas is in heaven. He was one of the 12. He, God, Jesus said, and the, the son of man have nowhere to lay his head. He have nowhere to get money. You know, it's just all, we say, man, Judas, he's definitely in heaven. But Judas isn't. Because of the sin of unbelief. And yet he followed Christ. He went out and soul wind. He went door to door. He, he went and shook his feet off when they went out by two by two in Matthew chapter 9, ending in the beginning of Matthew chapter 10. And we'd say, man, what a godly man. I want to be like Judas. I mean, you know, he did well. He took care of the money. He, he was one of the 12. So you, are you with me now? Because we don't want to get into this thing and think that, that oh no, you know, I, I got bitter the other day or I'm still dealing with some bitterness. I must not be saved. I better get saved again. No, 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 no. We're secure in Christ. When we switch our dependence from ourselves to Christ alone for the, for the atonement of sin, we're born again. But we see in the scriptures there are many people that, that, that think it's something else, and that's what the warning is even here today. Tim just told me this story the other day, very briefly. I can't go into great detail with it, but he told me about a couple in their 80s, married 60 years, did you tell me, or something, or whatever, and they were in a service and had been in church for 40, 50 years, I don't know, for quite a long time as a husband and wife. And all of a sudden, they both heard a message and said, oh my goodness, we are not saved. Not because of behavior, but they realized that they never trusted Christ alone to forgive them of their sins. So, so there's a test here. And, and that's what we want to look at. That's what 1 John's all about. Five tests to find out your insurance of salvation. Can you pass those tests? And when you pass them, it gives you the, uh, the assurance of your salvation. So, so, um, so we see that that is important. Now, one has said this, and I bet that you've heard this before. I, I've heard it. Who knows where it came from? And I don't want to be trite with it. That's why I'm saving it to right now to say, after we've already set kind of the foundation that we need to view today as we go. But one has said this. When we get to heaven, we will be surprised on who is there and who's not there. Well, where's Larry? Or what are you doing here? I always thought about that with my, my mother-in-law got saved, feisty woman, and uh, got saved at the very end of her life. And then... Um, her uh, brother-in-law got saved years later. Of course, she was gone years later. He got saved, and he was, uh, probably had a, a, a very, uh, certainly living a life his way, and he got saved. And I bet when they see each other at the corner of Glory and State Street, they're going to say to each other, what are you doing here? 
Well, the reason they're going to say that is because they place their faith in Christ alone. It isn't the behavior, but it is the behavior in a sense, because that reveals, because we see in the day of provocation, many did not enter into his rule. His rest because of the sin of unbelief, and that unbelief means infidel. Unbelief is used quite a few times in the scriptures, but the seven times it's used in the text that we're in, in Hebrews 3 and in other places, it always means unbelief, meaning infidel, not being born again. So they can't enter into God's rest because they've never been born again. Even if their behavior is really good. Hey, there's some people out there that would put Christians to shame with their morality and their goodness and their kindness. So it's not the behavior that we're looking at, but we're looking at the real deal here. So our points today are, we might not get through it all now that I'm looking at this. Uh, consider the Christ, because I think that the um, one person told me today, just make sure you lay the foundation right. Thank you. Consider the Christ. And our second point is, Consider the cautioning. Consider the Christ. Consider the cautioning. So let's get started. Our point number one is consider the Christ. The writer of the letter of Hebrews is concerned for the people. He will use a historical event, which we just read, to expose the danger of unbelief, dying as an infidel. The writer teaches us how dangerous those behaviors are if they are unchecked. They will lead to apostasy from faith. So we looked at uh, Psalm 95, but I want to read one more verse. I want to reread a verse out of there and then launch into this of considering Christ. Psalm 95, 10 says, 40 years long, because that's how long, 40 years long was I grieved with this generation and said, it is a people that do err in their heart, for they have not known my ways. So wherefore I was grieved, or the word grieve, the word here means that he was offended with or that they were vexed, or that he was vexed with them, because they always err in their heart. Their long trial of 40 years have been sufficient to show it was a character of a people that were disposed, of, uh, disposed to wandering from God. He was pulling this group out of all the Israelites that came out of Egypt, maybe a million or a million plus, and says, some are just along for the ride. They had never been born again. They've never put their faith and trust in God. Though they look like us, though they're Jewish, though they came out, they are not believing that the Messiah will come. And he says, you can tell over these 40 years, they murmured. They complained at everything. They tried to switch everything to meet their needs. It was all about making God their God in the sense of what they want. And so he grieved them. He said they're always air in their, in their heart. He said 40 years are enough to show what the character is. They had seen his works. They had been called to obey him. They had received his law, and yet their conduct during the time had shown that they were not willing to obey him. They had that unbelief. A person who claims to possess Christ and has lived in sin, who, who, who during all the time has rebelled against God and disregarded all his appeals, who have lived for themselves and not for their maker, the warning is, examine yourself. Hey, maybe you are saved. And you're just going through a season that is terrible here. But wait a minute, these are warning signs that says, examine yourself. Examine that your faith is in Christ alone. For us, his death, his burial, and his resurrection, not based on works or not based on what I've done, but him alone, that he, that he saved me. And so the scriptures say that these type of situations ought to cause us to examine ourselves. If those who live such a life were to die, they would not enter into his rest, he was saying, because of their unbelief. See, we know they were in unbelief because he said that many of them were in unbelief. So we know not everyone that went out from Egypt was born again. And he says, listen, you're without uh, excuse because I have guided you. I've given you the law and yet you have spurned it. You have rejected it. And though you're with the group, doesn't mean you just get a pass. You must come to personal faith in Christ alone. You could be here today. I'm glad you are. But that doesn't mean that you're on your way to heaven. You might be 
here probably maybe the most righteous person or moral person of everyone in here, but that's not the requirement for eternal life. The requirement for eternal life is to believe that we are sinners by birth and we choose to, and Christ paid the price on the cross, being fully God, fully man. He bore our sins. He died, buried, and rose again. And so by putting our faith in him, we can be born again. So it isn't works driven, and that's what he was trying to drive here. Just because you came out with the Israelites doesn't mean you're saved. Just because you took that lamb and you slayed it and put it over the doorpost the night before you left doesn't mean you're saved. That's just you just obeyed, but doesn't mean that you're saved. And so he's saying that some of you, maybe even here today, you've never really put your faith and trust in Christ, and so you are without excuse. They'd be separated from God in a place that was never designed for man, a place called hell that burns with fire and brimstone. That is where that soul will go. That's where that person will go because of unbelief. It's not a, this is not a message that most people want to preach, right? But the thing is, is examine, examine yourself. Make sure you're in the household of faith, not based off of maybe an attitude, but based off of the gospel that Jesus Christ alone can save us from our sins. They could not blame God because God sends nobody to a Christless eternity. It is chosen by unbelief. The last sin that every person that spends eternity separated from God is the sin of unbelief. They don't believe that Christ is the answer. So a person during these years, God says, was showing a heart of unbelief. Certainly our actions ought to make us aware that something's not right. I either need to get right or I need to be saved. See, he says, they have not known my ways. They were rebellious. They have not been acquainted with the true God. Hebrews chapter 3, verses 1 through 3, I mean uh, 3 rather, uh, verse 3, Hebrews 3, 3 says, Wherefore, so we know wherefore means, he's talking about since he started the letter, holy brethren, so he's talking to the believers, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. So our first point here is our first principle, our first life principle is for us is to learn and to apply, consider Christ. For those who consider Christ give evidence of saving faith. The passage is addressed to those that are born again, separated from the world unto Jesus Christ. Consider him. The word consider in our text means um, make the person and work of Christ Jesus will be the subject of deep and habitual thought. Those that, 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 that are examining themselves ought to see that they are considering Christ. That this is their love. This is their habitual thought. They want to wake up and think about him. They're so glad that they are saved. And they see fruit in their life that nobody else can explain. The word consider means to exercise uh, the mind, to perceive, to think, to understand, to observe fully. So as we learn about Christ and memorize and meditate on his character, it begins to change us through the work of the Holy Spirit. It will strengthen our faith by removing the impurities that cause us not to see Christ correctly. Defeat should not be normal. And victory should not be a surprise for a believer. The duty of considering Christ is a radical importance for the believer. In other words, if I'm up and my passion is, which was never before, is to consider Christ, boy, those are evidence of being born again. That I want to learn more about my Savior. I want to know what the scriptures say. I want to pray to him. I want to spend time with him. And then there's a natural response to that. That faith that we trust him in the midst of all of our circumstances. See what was taking place in the day of provocation is they came out with the Israelites. But many of them were unsaved. They were in unbelief. And so they just went along with what everybody else was doing. And God says, no, 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 you need to be considering Christ in Hebrews 3. This is a warning. Make sure you're in the household of faith. Now, how many of you remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Okay, they were about to be thrown into a fire for their faith. They would not bow down before this giant statue of Nebuchadnezzar, King Nebuchadnezzar. And so this was the first and second group that was taken out of 
Jerusalem, out of Judah, and taken into captivity. And so there was quite a few of them. But only three stood. What happened to the other ones? Well, they were either in unbelief or they didn't have enough faith to trust God. But Meshach, Shadrach, um, Meshach and Abednego, this is how they responded to what was going on um, in, in Daniel chapter 3, verses 16 through 18. It says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If so be, our God whom you serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thy hand, O king, but if not... Be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship them. So in other words, they considered their faith. And so because of that, they were willing to follow God no matter what. And those are evidence of belief. Now, I don't know about all the other Jewish boys that were there. Were they all unsaved? I don't know, but they certainly didn't take a stand. So either they were just going along with it, or maybe... They were not saved. The Bible tells us in 2 Peter 1.10, Wherefore the rather, brethren, to make your calling and election sure, for if you do these things, you shall never fall. See, when we consider Christ, then we, we, we know that we're in the household of faith by the fruits that produce by the Holy Spirit. So in other words, when we're considering Christ and we see God working in our life to use us in a way that's so contrary to the way we used to be, we say, I have a father. I would have never thought this way before. I don't know about you, but before I got saved, I never read any of the Bible. I mean, I mean, I was aware of it. I mean, I went to catechism and I was Catholic, so I would go to service, but I did not know him. But now when I take a look behind me and I see all these baskets behind me and I see fruit in them, you know what I say? Wow, that's God. God did that. Because I couldn't do that. So what it does is it makes my election sure because I see fruit that only the Holy Spirit can produce, which is only through believers. But maybe you're here today and you're really not sure where you spend eternity. Well, I would get that nailed down. Because we don't accidentally get to heaven. Nobody gets to heaven and said, wow, I'm so surprised I'm here. Because it is a conscious act of realizing that we are a sinner and Christ is the only answer. But it goes on and it says, consider the cautioning. Let's look at our text. Hebrews chapter 3 verse 6. But Christ, as a son over his own house, whose house we are, so in other words, Christ built everything. He's the creator of all things. And, and we don't build our own house. We don't build our own way. We don't make our own way. Through Moses, the prophet, it was, was glorious, but, but, but Christ is greater because he's the builder of the house. Uh, Moses was able to, to, to expose the Ten Commandments because God gave them to him. But he was just a servant. But it goes on and says, If we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm until the end. Well, it sounds to me that if you depart from, if you have a bad day or something like that, you could lose your salvation. In verse 6, we see that salvation is evidenced by perseverance. Holding fast is not the means of salvation. It is the proof of it and the product of it that we don't, we don't flee. That we trust God, not only in salvation, but we trust Him in the day-to-day -day life. This is, a clear, this is clear from a careful examination of the words. Hebrews 3, 6 does not say that we will be, be God's house if we hold fast to the end. We are God's house if we hold fast. In other words, uh, God, when we, when we do stray, God convicts us and we realize we're doing wrong and we get those things right. A person of unbelief uh, is still trusting his own way to heaven. Is the assurance of our salvation manifested? Our salvation from first to last rests upon Christ himself. Because it rests upon Christ, it's secure and unchangeable eternally. So in other words, it's not our works, but our works also then give us the confidence that we're his. Because the Bible says, neither by the blood of goats or calves, 
but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us all. So once saved, always saved. So the cry here is, hey, listen, if you're here today, you're like saying, yeah, I'm saved. I remember putting my faith in Christ alone. I know I'm not all I should be. I know I struggle at times. I know there's some areas that need to be worked on, but I know that I know that I know that my faith is in Christ and Christ alone. That's the confidence of it. But some can't say that. They're not sure. And that's what he's saying. Examine yourself. If, if you're doubting or you're not sure, you don't understand, then come and make sure you're in the household of faith. It's just not saying I'm saved. It's just not saying, oh, well, I'm saved. No. It is a work of God when we come to Him in humility, realizing we're a sinner, and there's nothing we can do to atone for our sin except for the work on the cross, and we put our faith and trust in Him alone. That's the confidence then. And then we produce fruit. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to um, skip over here. I'm going to tell you some, some verses that are a little disconcerting. So a person who has a profession of faith but is contradicting it by the lifestyle of their life should examine themselves according to the scriptures. Don't come to me and ask me if you're saved. I don't know. I can tell you what the gospel is and I can tell you what you need to do to be saved, but I don't know if you're saved. The Bible says in 1 John 2, 19, they went out from us because they were, never, they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have no doubt had continued with us. But they went out that they might be manifest that they were not at all of us. So in other words, when things get tough, see in America, Christianity is pretty easy. I mean, what persecution or what difficulties do we really face? I know there's, there's difficulties with, with emotions or difficulties with our bodies, but, but we're, not, we're, not, we're, not, uh, we're, not, we're not in danger of life today. See, the amazing thing is, is every time the church is persecuted, about 80% flee and about 20% 20, 20 stay. When, 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 um, when Russia opened up the door for Christianity to come from the outside, when Reagan said, tear down this wall, Mr. Gorbachev, and he did, and, and, and it was flooded with people, the true believers there said, I don't recognize that Christianity. That Christianity says, live any way you want. Just, you know, try on Jesus. Because every day they got up, they realized they could lose their life. So that was a genuine, right? I mean, if you knew you had a good chance of losing your life when you went out this door today for the faith, would you be here? And so they didn't recognize that. And so when, 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 when communism came, the church shrunk to very little people. And that's what God was saying here in the time of Egypt. They came out, but not all were saved, and many died in their sins. Now look at Matthew 7, uh, 21 through 23. It says this. <coughs> it says, not everyone, not everyone, many, but not everyone, that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven... Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name cast out devils, and in thy name done many works. And then I will profess unto them, saying, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. Examine yourself. They built their own God. They built their own salvation plan. They said, you know what? I'm just going to be a do-gooder, and I'm going to be to heaven. I'm going to take sacraments and I'm going to get to heaven. I'm going to do this, and I'll get to heaven. I'll be very moral, and I'll get to heaven. So they really believe they're going to heaven. But he says, I'm going to say, I never knew you, because that's not salvation. Salvation is realizing there's nothing you can do because it was done by him. So examine yourself. See, it isn't if you know God, it's if he knows you. He's exhorting those whom he addressed to beware of an evil heart of unbelief in Hebrews 3.12. He's saying that it was such a heart that, ex that excluded the Hebrews from the promised land. They just didn't believe that God could drive out the Canaanites, could not drive out the enemies. And so they wandered for, for 40 years in the wilderness. Many of them were saved. They just had 
short faith, but some had a heart of unbelief. The same thing says he, he, he must exclude you from heaven. He promised a home, a home of the believers. And if that firm confidence in God and his promises, what he requires is wanting, you'll be excluded from the world of eternal rest. So examine yourself. Don't, I'm, I'm not telling you to look at your works. I'm telling you to look at the gospel. That's the measuring stick. Are you perfect? Well, of course not. But Christ makes you perfect by his imputed righteousness. That's how we know we're saved. That's how we know. So today, the reason the church is so weak is probably a good percentage of them are not even saved. They're just good doers. Because if really, if we were considering Christ and we were carrying out his will, then we wouldn't have the problems we have in America today. Certain people wouldn't be able to be elected because they could never get the votes. But so many people today, they just whatever, whatever, whatever. And God says, wait a minute. So, the Bible tells us in verses 7 and 8, Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost say today, If you hear my voice, harden not your heart, as in the provocation in the day of temptation, in the wilderness. Listen, don't blow this off. Israel's M.O. was disobedience. And if your M.O. is to be disobedient and far from God, you really don't think about him. Hey, listen, examine yourself. Either something has to be adjusted in your walk with Christ or you've never been born again. They murmured against their ways, against God. Jude says there are certain men crept in unawares who have before of old ordained ordained this to condemnation, ungodly men turning the grace of God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God, our Lord Jesus Christ. So in other words, some are in the church uh, 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 spreading false doctrine to think that salvation is whatever you want it to be. I was invited to a conference one time. I did not go because of one comment that was made on there. It said, listen, we're all not going to agree. Just hang your doctrine at the door and come on in and celebrate Jesus. Well, what is that? That's that. I don't want to be that. That's, that's not what we're to do. We're to be somewhere where we're growing in our Christ-likeness and we understand that we're saved and God's got a plan for us. My wife showed me a doctrinal statement one day and it was called the silent doctrine or something. Silence. I don't remember. <coughs> I'm sure it was you. Um, it was my wife. But anyways, um, it was silence doctrine. And what it said was this. It says, at our church, we just choose not to talk about these doctrines because not everyone can agree on them. So that means uh, try on Jesus, keep your sin, the grace is wide, come and have a ball. But that's not what God says. God says that those that are born again, it isn't that we're trying to produce works, we just naturally produce works because we so love him. I'm just not going to do that. I have liberty to do it, but I'm not going to do it because I want to see people saved. I want to see people come to Christ. And so that's what he's talking about here. So uh, the meaning of the word unbelief, and you can look this up later, there's seven times that's used and in the Greek. It means without faith, without saving faith. It's an infidel. They were never justified. All flesh looks the same. We can't determine who's saved and who's not. Listen, there was a time in my life where, you know, there was a good year, year and a half there that was pretty bad after I got saved. If you would have met me that day, you would have said, pray for Larry Coons, he needs to be saved. But I was saved, and I knew I was saved, and I knew I was doing wrong, and I knew I needed to get right. So, there's a weed called Bearded Darnell. Never heard of it before. Maybe if you're a farmer here, you have. And that it is extremely close to wheat and difficult to distinguish from it when the plants are young and growing. The roots of the two plants entangle themselves around each other, but when the heads of the grain appear on the wheat, uh, they, you, can't, you can't tell the difference. 
And so that's what Matthew's talking about in 1330. He said, let both of those grow together until the harvest. And at that time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, gather ye first the tares, bind them up in bundles and burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. So what he's saying here is that the wheat and the tares are together. Uh, we can't tell the difference. We're intertwined together. You really don't know if I'm saved. I really don't know if you're saved. You, you say you are. That's great, but I don't really know that. But when the great reaping takes place and they come down, they'll separate the tares from the wheat because God knows. You can't fool God. You've either come to faith in Christ alone through his death, his burial, and his resurrection, and his work on the cross. You've either come that way or there's no other way to come. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. But as many as received him, to them gave the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believeth on his name. Call upon the Lord, and he will save you. For with the heart man is made unto righteousness, with the mouth confession is made. So, so we realize that um, this is what he's talking about here. He's not talking about our works, though our works do for us that are saved give us that confidence of seeing that fruit. And we say, there's no way that I can do what I'm doing without the Holy Spirit doing it for me. So examine yourself. All unbelief must be removed. We must believe God's word. Unbelief is the great disorder of the heart. It is a fertile ground for continual hardness. It places self in the center of our life. Unbelief is not trusting God at his word. When God's word is not given in its rightful place, we live in unbelief. And that's, what, that's what Satan does. He comes in and he sows disharmony and he causes problems because he wants to mix things up so people really don't know, is it, is it, is it hating this and hating these people and hating this? That makes us righteous? Is it, is, is, is it my word? What, what is it? And so there's all this religion out there, but Christ says it's a relationship. But when it's not given rightly, we live in unbelief. So the warning, again, is examine yourself. Examine yourself. You go to the doctor all the time for him to examine you, to find out what the problem is. God says, examine yourself that your faith is not based on what you've done or what you're doing at that moment, but that moment that you were justified alone by trusting Christ for his imputed righteousness. That is what it is. The rest will take care of itself. Uh, who's here has arrived? I mean, we haven't arrived. We're still working through some of those difficult situations in our life, that besetting sin, those sins that... Just keep gripping up, and God's working on those things. But he says, make sure you're in the household of faith. So that's the challenge to you today. Make sure you're in the household of faith. Don't, because if you die, the Bible tells us very clearly in Hebrews, in unbelief, you cannot enter into his rest. It must be the real deal. So if, you're, if you realize you're a sinner and that you have no hope outside of Christ, then you need to be born again. But if you say, I already know that, and I've already put my faith and trust in Christ, praise God. Keep going. Don't allow the deceitfulness of sin to pull you away from keeping God's mission of making and maturing disciples. What are you allowing in your life as believers to pull you away, to sideline you from accomplishing God's will? What is it? Is it friends? Is it some type of um, enslaving sin? What is it? Get rid of it and trust God as you grow in your Christ-likeness. I know that I know that I know that I know that I'm saved because I'm a pastor. I know that I know that I know that I'm saved because I was baptized. No. I know that I know that I know that I'm saved because I transferred my dependence to Christ alone and his work, and nobody can take that away from me. I will not die in the sin of unbelief, but many will. Many will. Maybe that's you. This is where I want to be very careful. I'm not trying to get someone lost to just pray another prayer. If you understood, and you believed it, and you depended, you're saved. 
That's what the Bible says. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believeth on his name. Father, thank you today. This is um, a passage that probably maybe never even heard preached before, but it is a great warning of urgency. And so we want to make sure that we are in the household of faith. We want to examine our heart. So, Father, as we now go to a part of an invitation here, I pray that we would examine our own hearts. We're not going to look around the auditorium and say, well, that person's certainly not saved. <laughs> There's no doubt in, in the world that they could possibly be saved. Look at the way they dress or look at the way they talk or look at where they live. No, 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 no. no. It's not based on that. Maybe some things need to be corrected in people's lives. Certainly, I'd be the first one to raise my hand. But are you sure you're saved because you put your faith and trust in Christ alone and you're justified? If so, praise God. Let's get busy with getting rid of those things that cause us not to carry out the mission. So with your eyes closed and your heads bowed here at Faithway Baptist Church, we want to give an invitation, which is simple. If you're here today and you say, wow, I listened and for the first time I get it, that my sin is so awful that I need a Savior and that Savior is Christ. I've never put my faith and trust in Christ. So actually I have the sin of unbelief. If I died today, I would not go to heaven. And I finally realized that and that's bothering me. And I'd like to talk to somebody to know for sure where I would spend eternity you know, just shoot up your hand um, and put it right back down. Won't call you, won't come to you, but i just like pray for you. Would you just shoot up your hand and say, I'm not sure where I'm going. I just don't know. I just don't know. Now, if you're here today and you say, you know what, I know I'm born again. There's no doubt about it. I'm sure that I put my trust and faith in Christ alone, and I see the fruits of that new life in Christ that can only be from him. Would you just raise your hand and say, I know I'm saved. I know I'm saved. Raise them up there, and that's it. See, now not everyone can raise their hand. There were several hands that were not raised. So either one, you didn't understand the question, or you didn't feel like raising your hand, or something like that. But maybe you didn't raise your hand because you don't, you don't know where you'll spend eternity, and that's bothering you enough. Come see me. Come see me. We'll spend the afternoon together. I have no plans. Spend the whole day together. No problem. Until we see what the scriptures say. That's how important it is, because you're not promised tomorrow. Would you play, Miss Eve? Make the decision you need to make. Examine your heart. Just like you're examining your heart now for the Lord's table. Is there anything in my heart that would prevent me from taking the Lord's table? Is there something I need to get right? Dale and I talked to a man this week that Dale's been witnessing to for months, maybe even a year now. He thinks he's saved, but he doesn't believe it's Christ alone. He's in the sin of unbelief. Father, thank you for the scriptures. Thank you that they are uh, the rule for us, the pillar and ground of truth. Thank you for it. Help us to understand it. But only the Holy Spirit can do the work that needs to be done for a person to come to faith. Certainly, um, I can't do that. We can only preach what you say. Help that to be the case. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. And then, Tim, you're going to get the kids. Okay. And um, Sam, thank you. You were a help to me today. I really appreciate that. Thank you for godly men and 
that help encourage brothers along the way. I really appreciate that. And then once again, um, I didn't even mention it yet, but Paul made his way up here. Thank you so much, Paul, for playing today as well. And um, you say, well, I'm not coming here anymore because I've been here for like eight hours and we've still got more left. And I apologize for that, but sometimes it's hard to get it all out. I mean, you know, we, we could spend a whole month on this subject itself, but I think you get the gist. I think you get it. So we want to take time to slow down also once a month to partake in the Lord's table. If you're born again, you know Jesus Christ as your Savior. Uh, you, you're, you're convinced of that. You know that. Then you can partake in this time of remembering the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, as the children are coming in, thank you for coming in. But I also ask you children, yeah, Jeremiah's got, he came up too many rows. Jer Jeremiah, I get it. You're always right where in front of Nancy, and you're not, your mom is not there today. Um, as we partake in this, um, if you're born again, you know the Lord, please partake in it. Children, we're glad you're here. We want you up here for this, but at the same time, I need you to kind of let people meditate and think through this as we have meditated music in a moment. And um, would you... Um, uh, uh, Sam, would you pray for the bread that you're about to pass, uh, his broken body on the cross for our sins? Amen. 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 And Paul, thank you. The scriptures tell us in 1 Corinthians chapter number 11, it said, um, 
It says here, and when he given thanks, oh, I'm sorry, for I have received of the Lord that which also I deliver unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread in that upper room. And when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. Then, Pete, would you please um, lead us to the throne regarding the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ? Father in heaven, thank you so much for what you've done for us, Lord, and as we think on uh, this month, the Resurrection Sunday that we celebrate, Lord, as we look forward to the church, here is the Amen.